warm welcome on other Derana 24 at Hyde Park tonight we will be talking to uh, a personality who was once the finance minister once the foreign minister of Sri Lanka a controversial figure at times uh, a member of parliament and now uh, the candidate for the United National Party representing the Colombo district. May I warmly welcome Ravi Karnanayak, a former minister, former MP, Colombo district candidate for the UNP. Good evening. Good thank evening. you very much for giving this opportunity. Thank you, thank you. We, we are glad that you have the time to join us at Hyde Park. Um, you'll be contesting for the elections around the corner. Um, there's so much of controversy surrounding your name too uh, in the recent past. And uh, as we talk about these elections, there's a split between uh, your party. Uh, we'd like to speak of all that, but how do you, how do you uh, intend to come about, come around all these accusations and allegations surrounding uh, your name and the party too? Well, I think just a mischievous attempt made by the media, and I guess it's scandalous because sometimes without any base, uh, they basically s uh, project various accusations. And end of the day, they basically end up apologizing, saying, sorry, we didn't know that that was the case. And even on this case, what you are basically projecting, I like to get it straight off the uh, front itself by saying that I was not the finance minister. I was the finance minister, but I didn't have the central bank nor the uh, commercial banks under my purview. I mean, this is like running a tavern without uh, Arak. You know, you be that type of accusation, I guess uh, it sometimes is very immoral by the media institutions that take things on without any, any premise. So I think there has to be some scruples that is there. Just because there is a, a, a calculated attempt by some people to tarnish people who can work. And I guess that has been, a, a, I would say, a style that is there in Sri Lankan politics. That anybody who can work is targeted by the people who can't work. But in that case, this would be um, common to any member of parliament, be it the UNP, uh, the uh, SLPP, Sri Lanka Freedom Party. Uh, but given, given the kind of accusations leveled at you, since we're talking about the central bank bond scam, yeah. you said the central bank was not under you. And the common accusation is that you were the finance minister at the time. And also during this time that you oversaw uh, such a massive controversial deal and uh, failed to thwart it. But this is an accusation that will continue to be uh, under your name. How would you work about this? Because we, we are looking at is, a It is very easy just to say that, so I ask you, what is the bond scan? Yeah, it is just a hype in uh, some people's mind. It's a, a storm in a teacup. If you basically ask what it is, I don't think any media institution is able to say what it is. And I need to take it up front because I think there is too much going ra down, uh, dancing around the uh, particular issue rather than get direct to it. So I guess it is a situation where you're asking, what is this particular one that is there? If you ask, none of the media institutions are, are able to answer to that in the very. This is just a common feeling that has been spread by a bunch of people who think that they basically know it all. And this is part of the officials in the central bank. And I was so happy to see the president taking the system on. I mean, for five years, I've been saying the problem lies nowhere else but in the central bank itself. And now you could see as to how it's spearheading into each individual person. Now, if you say the bond scam, what it is, you are unable to answer. Why it is? Because it is only a mythical exercise that is there. Now, the central bank is an independent institution. Debts are taken by them. Where does the Minister of Finance get involved? I, finance minister is the case. But here is a Minister of Finance that didn't have the central bank and the commercial bank. So it makes a case that much better for but wasn't it, uh, wasn't it a shortfall in the government then that the finance minister, uh, a personality as yours, a chartered accountant, somebody who's, uh, who's uh, more than qualified to run the economy and finance, to have been given the uh, central bank under his purview? The not given. To, to have to, to that, that it was a failure of the UNP that they have uh, that, not. That, that's what, is, uh, what I've got to do is with what is given to me. You know, I can't use her powers when it is not with us. So but that but you was were part a of that government. You advocated for that government, well government of good governance, government and it was your, good you, governance. You're a stalwart. You're a senior person in the government. Yeah, that, that good governance thought that separation of power is the best form of, uh, you know, internal control that are there. So if that was a uh, that was a belief that was there, it, I mean, who am I to basically question that? Subsequently, ministers got that particular one because they thought it was not prudent thing. But at the time I held it, it was not there. 
and I have to be accountable to what it is given to me. And the sadness is that the Sri Lankans accuse widely when the foreign people basically look at how the finance was run in 2015, 16, 17, and vote us as the Asia Pacific best finance minister. You are so the best finance a, minister. It is, it is sometimes uh, indictment on the Sri Lankan sense of honesty and, and uh, help that is given to the Sri Lankans. Here is the outside world looking at Sri Lanka and seeing how prudent the financial discipline it is taken forward. And that sometimes it is sad. Uh, you were um, you were nominated. You were voted as the best finance minister, Asia Pacific, and this is you said this is how the world saw you. But again, we come back to the government of good governance at the time, uh, when you were more qualified to run the ministry, the economy. When you when we talk about you not being given the reins in its full capacity, it's is it not just the people, but also the government itself, that they had not given you the full powers. Absolutely right. I totally agree with you. And I blame nobody else but some of the recalcitrant members that were there, which did not pursue a united approach in governing. And there, the president, uh, then president, was also culpable in not giving that to us, because he had his own mythical exercise of what was going on. And that basically brought in uh, internal revolt within the party. There's nothing to hide. I mean, this is a conflict that is internalized, which is an internal affair, which was externalized. And um, we were victims for nothing. Your leader, uh, Ranu Vikramasinghe, former pa Prime Minister, you're now advocating for his side to win this election uh, against uh, Sajid Premadasas, because we see there's a split in the UNP with the Samagi Janabala Vega. Many UNP stalwarts are with Sajid. But again, uh, Ranu Vikramasinghe, then Prime Minister, he had uh, a, a massive power within the government. So is it right to, have, uh, to, to uh, blame uh, former President Sirisena himself? for not giving the right powers, for not uh, vesting those right powers with the relevant people? Well, when I say that he was culpable, he was part of the exercise in bringing moral pressure in order not to appoint on certain things, for reasons best unknown up to this moment. And recently he basically says, yes, I mean, he was in the, in the disguise that, you know, it was this, and he regrets that it was the case. Now, you ask the question about assumptions of certain people that have left the party. Please, I guess it's your own perception, but the general people are completely different to what you're thinking. And this so-called lot that has gone out is simply because they were unable to look at the political parties, disciplinary approach, the mannerism in how we are going to do certain things that were there. And most of, the them, most of them that have left are people who lost the presidential election, the electorates that were there. So these people that follow, it is a wishful thinking. If it was so powerful and so uh, popular, you would have won the presidential elections. So UMP has X amount of votes, and that was any case garnered by him. And the rest of it is what was there, which basically couldn't get 1.5 million votes, that was the deficit that was between the two contestants. So I guess it is absolutely erroneous to come and say that he has a figure, if he had it, he would have won it. And the very fact that he was unable to win shows that there was a huge discrepancy between the, the real want of the numbers that were there. The youth were not there. The business community was not there. The middle class was wondering what was being told. And this was what was told there before. So I need that corrected because otherwise that general impression saying that he has a following. He's not a pipe pied piper that carries th things through. I mean, look at his own district in Hambantota, which he's contesting. When he started, he had 45%, and ended he had 24%. So if the popularity is there, you can't be having a setback of that in your own presidential election. But what's the rationale behind your support to Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Ranil Vikrama Singha? Well, the support is that we are United National Party. We are not based on one person that is there. This is the party that was, this is the oldest party which was started by D.S. Serenaika. Then it followed up to uh, D.S. Serenaika, Sir John Kotalavla, J.R. Javadana, Rana Singha Premadasa, D.B. Vijayatunga, and into Ranil Vikram Singha. This is a, a thing that goes on from the very origin itself. So it is not based on a, a particular person. This is a national, United National Party, which uh, basically has certain principles that we uh, advocate. And that's what goes on. One of the main involvements is the Sri Lankan identity. Then we basically look at, you know, a sense of the economic revival of the country. Then we look at sense of balance between all it. We don't take extreme view that is there on certain things. And that is where we basically give the opportunity for anybody to come into the leadership of a party. 
There are certain differences, but those are met inside the uh, party uh, affair rather than externalize it. Unfortunately, some of them make it externalized, and they tell the media something, and what really goes on inside is not revealed. I think we should take a short break at Hyde Park. We'll return to speak more. Welcome back. You're joining us at Hyde Park. You were talking about uh, your support for uh, former Prime Minister Rana Wickremesinghe, a leader of the United National Party. But again, you spoke about how uh, undemocratic it is to not support uh, the UNP leadership when uh, when there is an internal rift to take it up within the party. But um, but we but we see that uh, but there is accusation that uh, he himself is not democratic in terms of running the party. So do you agree with how the party leadership he has run? How uh, how, how certain uh, the manner in which the party policy is being managed. Devari, I'm not here to whitewash anybody, but I'm only telling what goes internally is something that we have many difference of opinions. And at that time of difference of opinions exists, that does not mean that the substitutes that are found have to be better than what the existing ones are. And this is what has been proven. So what we want to do is to ensure that we have a team spirit that is there. You know, we don't want people that basically want to only individually score a century. We want a match winning uh, formula. And that's what we are basically doing. Uh, you had a very short period as minister between 2015 and uh, minister of finance 2015 to 2017 during which the 100 day program uh, as we talk about economics I would like to speak about policy that we need in the future but let's revisit the past too. Um, the 10,000 rupee salary increment for public service and then uh, the increase of Samurti beneficiaries. But also there were other uh, notable uh, changes that were brought about uh, simplification of the tax system, increasing the tax net. Those were positives. But again, the negatives impacted the economic revival and also um, the growth rate of the economy. The debt, yes, uh, you continue to say that, uh, say that you inherited a massive debt. Uh, to GDP at the time, but uh, we did not see the economy coming out of it. We kept accumulating debt. The, we basically promised 100 uh, proposals in 100 days, and we were able to execute 20, uh, 88 in 23 days, and none of them had an economic impact. What we did was we increased our revenue and reduced the cost in order to meet the salary increases, which were long overdue, the structural amendments that were done, the fiscal space was created by the revenue increases and the cost reductions, make it meaningful expenditure to come forward. Because the recurrent expenditure was just rampart. There was no controls at all. And these were the leakages that took place. So on the areas of the proposal that we said, everything we promised to the people, what we executed. If I may just take one to two minutes on that, you had 10,000 rupees salary increase given to the government servants, were there for 11 years. What, what we did was we ensured that that was uh, rectified and we gave them the, more, the promise that we basically said during elections. Then we uh, corrected the anomalies that were there for the pensions. Then the security forces, uh, many were only talking, lip service was given to the armed forces, but we were the ones who gave 40% to the police and the armed forces. We had the um, area that were basically deficit in management. That was the correction. There, there were certain revenue expenditure that was uh, sorry, uh, capital expenditure that was there in the armed forces. We corrected those. So when we went along, we uh, increased the salaries. We reduced the cost of living. If you remember the petrol that was 162, which was there for three four years. We went to courts to reduce it. They said can't. But when he came in as a finance minister, I was able to reduce it from 162 to 120. Diesel was 140 to 110. Petrol, I'm sorry, uh, kerosene oil to 50 rupees. Gas that was 2,650 was reduced to 1,350. Today it can be reduced to 975. It's being kept artificially high. When world prices are coming down, we have one country that has increased. Then on the areas of cost of living, sugar, dal, canned fish, all were reduced. Then you had the senior citizens getting 15% interest when the interests were being driven down. We, we wanted a certain secure interest for the elderly statesmen of this country. Agriculture was made tax-free. So we revived the entire economic downturn that was there because it was a downturn that was, it was an economic rundown economy that was given to us. So within that 30 months of me running the finance ministry, Myself and the team of the finance ministry 
peer assisted by the cabinet of ministers, we were able to do that massive change. That's why we were able to increase revenue from 10.1% uh, of GDP to 19, oh, sorry, 14.8% by 2017. And it was an increase of 35% that was there. I mean, a classic example for the excise duty. Excise duty was collecting 2 billion a year, uh, 2 billion a month. We increased it to 12 billion a month. So imagine a 10 billion per month. That was 120 billion coming to state coffers. Which was, I mean, when we inherited the economy, we basically had an income of 1,100, which was hardly sufficient to pay the interest of the uh, capital that was, uh, the borrowings that were there. We managed to ensure, bring in revenue increases that were able to meet and have a primary surplus in the, uh, uh, in the budget. So these are the areas that we did. So what were the areas that were detrimental, I would like to see. We reduced your pay that was there. We reduced the taxes that were supposed to be um, uh, targeted on individuals. And the companies were made to be more economically responsive. Uh, we speak about debt again, but um, these, the, the period of the good governance, that also saw some of the uh, slowest economic uh, growth rates of the country year after year. How do you look at this? That was once again a, a, a fallacy that was there because the previous regime uh, did not uh, have a corrective action on the GDP calculation that was there in the region. They postponed it to 215. So as a result, the formula that was being used was changed in 215. So if you compare the 215 to the past areas, then you could see that it was in the same rate, uh, growth rate that was there. Because when you take the calculation, the formula, and if you change that, that base rate changes all the activities. Now, if that were the case, which was, say, the, the 3 to 4%, 10, 5% growth, with inflation, which was 0.02% during our period for about two years, and then it went up to 2%, etc. So fundamentally, economically, it was well sound. Mm -hmm. But when you compare the growth rate, yes, but growth rate means nothing, because in a, in a country previously, you had the war expenditure. And we have a calculation of GDP on the expenditure basis. So you have a huge cost that is there on expenditure. On the war, that is also calculated part of GDP. Other during a war, you have 7% GDP. When you don't have the war, you have 4% GDP. So it doesn't make sense. But owing to the expenditure that is being used as a calculation basis for growth rate, that is a normal basis. Like, if I may give another classic example, you break a window. You, you basically uh, replace that. Now, that is economic activity. But what growth has that taken place in the country? You just replaced a broken window. So that is where we change the entire philosophy of instead of having development in one electorate, one district, we changed it to the entire 25 districts of the country. You had roads coming up, you had flyovers. I mean, they were talking during the past regime. It was only a road from Colombo to Gaul, which we basically had planned it in 2000. Uh, during our period, that was 2001. But, to but during your government, mega infrastructure development pro projects never came about, never materialized in such a massive way post war uh, that happened during the previous regime. Um, and, and yet, uh, there was accusation about a massive debt trap, uh, loan to GDP ratio. Uh, how do you respond to that? In the very, if Delana gives as much as what we have done, as the others have not done. I guess you will basically equate what we did. I'll give you an example. Roads they did was only Colombo to Gaul. We did Colombo to Gaul to Hambantota. We did the Candy Expressway. Then we changed the, the Northern Area Expressways for taking place. Then the housing. All those things were part of development. Uh, the, the harbors were developed. The airports were restructured. There were domestic airports being opened. You basically look at every corner had a development activity that was there. And unfortunately, as I said, sometimes we spend a million rupees on capital expenditure and get one rupee on media. Others spend mm, uh, 999,000 rupees on media and one rupee on a capital expenditure. That was the difference in attitude that was there from the media. So I don't accuse it. It was a generalized situation. And we also don't browbeat on ourselves what we basically do, which is a fault. We recognize that and we need to correct that. Because as much as we do must be shown. Otherwise, there's no meaningful development that is seen to the people's eyes. That is a, a stark reality in Sri Lankan politics in this country. But uh, even, uh, even the government, as in the coalition, uh, the former president uh, um, accused uh, a lack of uh, uh, contribution from the UNP-led side to 
revive the economy and that he did not have uh, the necessary powers to run the country as much as he wished. So there was, there was no common co consensus on uh, economy and the way the economy was run at the time. So do you think that there was any progress made as, as much as your side talks about it? In, the way, in order to leave the economy, you must know the economy now. There's no point having lip service on that. Those type of utterances of those statements come only in the last six months when we basically say we want to have our own presidential candidate. Up until that time, everything went rather sm uh, smooth sailing was taking place. So I guess that is an unwarranted utterance that has no base, uh, base to it. When you say there's no meaningful economic development, what happened to Moraga Khan? Who brought the money into that? He was languishing during his 10 years in the SLFP and he couldn't do anything. When we came in, we managed to get his dream uh, crystallized. So likewise, you see the uh, resurgence in Poland Narua. If you happen to go that way, you would see the tremendous mm, uh, development that has taken place. So is it something that he had plucked from his own economic miracles that are there? I mean, he basically did not know what type of allocation that came in on that basis. So it's very unfair to be elected by the UMP and basically be part of the downturn of that UMP. So he was instrumental in basically bringing disunity into the UMP. I think we need to take a short commercial break and Hyde Park will return to speak more. Welcome back. Um, let's talk a little about the current economic situation of the country. Um, with the onset of uh, President Gotabe Rajapaksa's uh, time as president, he has, he has had to face many challenges, a global um, health pandemic and uh, economic challenges that come alongside it. Uh, what is your take on the way the economy is managed uh, at present? Well, I think you've got to bifurcate the two. Uh, a viral that is affected the entire world is certainly something which is um, uh, something unique and we've got to face it, which was unknown factors that come in. But that is extricated from the economy because any case economic crisis are there every day. So it's not that something which is unique. But COVID-driven economic impact has taken place, but we must be able to have the innovativeness to come out of it. I would take this government and the president in handling it two ways. Handling of the COVID, certainly unknown entity, Everybody gave the support, at least from the United National Party, we gave unstinted support and we basically sail along to see that, you know, that type of doesn't have any ramifications or any uh, setbacks. But we don't want to see a second setback or anything like that. So we give the full benefit that goes on to COVID, couldn't or bad, it has done the correct way and we salute that. We no, no qualms about that. Coming to the economy, I think it's completely different. Uh, I think there has to be much more concerted effort taken by the government in order to ensure that we basically have a, a, a way forward. I mean, economic crisis is something which is there every day. It is how you come out of it is the problem. Now, when you look at the economy that we are talking of, there are two ends. One is the revenue that is dropping and the costs that are increasing. Now, how does this government respond to that? I don't see that there is a, a proper response that is there. You look at the president giving orders to the central bank to provide redress to the companies that have basically fallen into this COVID economic trap. But do you see that there is any response that comes to that? The central bank has been sleeping over three months. And that's why he had to, a week or two weeks ago, come back and say that, you know, eight months I've seen things going on, nothing is happening. So wake up and ensure that you give an answer tomorrow. So that just shows that government servants in some quarters just don't do what is expected of the government. Now that doesn't mean that that is basically left to the officials. That is part of the government. Every government faces this. We, when we basically handle the economy, we have the same. I wanted to have a single digit uh, lending process of you know having five, six percent uh, interest to the people because today our people are fighting uh, a, a banking revolt because if you look at the region, the lending rates are 4 to 5 percent, be it India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, Afghanistan, etc. But Sri Lanka is 15 to 18 percent. So your profit margin between the uh, spread between their country and our country, so how can you compete with them? Sri Lanka has to export and export or perish. So if, if we are not manufacturing and exporting, then we are gone. So if you have a 10 percent gap on interest rates, which is normally a profit margin, how on earth will you go forward? These are the things that we basically be fighting with central bank. 
individuals there, 20, 30 percent who earn 2 million, 3 million salaries, wait in air conditioned room, does not respond to the people who earn 20 to 25,000 rupee salaries that are there. This has been the bane that has been going on. Then you look at the economic situation. This year's budget was basically looked at, or at least the, uh, pro um, the, the projections were 4.6 4 billion, a trillion was the expenditure. That was m uh, meant to be 1.1 million on salaries and pensions. Uh, you basically had 780 billion on capital, ex capital amortization of loans. You had about 960 billion that was there on interest payments. Then you had uh, capital maintenance of the government assets that were there, about 760 billion, and capital expenditure, about 800 billion. So when you look at all of them, that has a 4,650 billion expenditure. Income was supposed to be 1,900, which was 2% only over last year. And last year, they couldn't achieve the uh, budgets uh, that were basically given. So within the 18 months, you could see that there's a yawning gap. The revenue that were expected for, for six months was 1,000 billion, but they have not even achieved 478 billion. Now, that shows that there is... But isn't that also given the current challenges well, that they face? Well, given the current challenges, I agree. But then you have to be innovative how to overcome those problems. What would you do different if you had to uh, take on the reins? If we basically had the... Op I mean, God willing, with the help of the people, if we, when we get elected on the 5th of August, we will be responding, firstly, is to ensure that we basically have the expenditure control. Secondly, the revenue increases cannot be put on people because they won't have any revenue source that is coming on. We look at reducing the interest rates that are there, bringing in more uh, partnership basis from international organizations instead of excluding them from the system. We find many are taking systems on when we should be basically luring them and getting them coming into the system. Then we basically have a strong rupee rate that will be helpful in order to uh, get um, uh, monies coming into the country and then ensure that we basically look at certain innovative approaches, you know, uh, basically using collateralization of the assets that are there. You have the PPP model, which I can see that they are trying to attempt to use, and ensure that the fallacy of this, you know, trying to hold on to things that are not yours, we, we basically looked at more commercialized. Today, this decisive decision making is what is missing, and that needs to come in. You know, the biggest problem in this country is that people are worried to take that uh, initial, the additional step, which is in a discretionary power. The discretionary power when you take, you basically have to come before many commissions and say, why you did this, why you did that? So that there is no decision-making power that can be basically be collective and be coming out of this nonsense. Because as soon as you are trying to be innovative, you get lugged with the thing that this is corruption-oriented. This is the biggest problem in this country in the very. You don't know how it impacts on people that are there. You know, we take decisions, we increase revenues, and suddenly we are going to come before commission asking why that was reduced, why this was increased, etc. So how can we make a decision? How can the officials basically be carrying out duties that are there? This is something that is strangulating the economy. And that needs to correct. You know, we have uh, acts that are there in parliament which are archaic. You have the, uh, um, the customs ordinance which is 1869. You had the Finance Act, which is 1971. You know, these have to be modernized in today's age. Today we are in a digitalized era. Your government, uh, back in the day, uh, you all came to power on the back of promised uh, reform in these areas. You promised to bring changes in these areas, but that was not forthcoming. And now... Uh, no, I don't say that. We had a lot of changes in the very, but it was not, I mean, good enough, good enough, and better is expected. You have a huge lot of things that have got to be done. Economy has to have complete overhauling. Now you look at the Eastern countries. They were languishing behind. Today they have leapfrogged because they were able to take the digitalized approach. But that basically helped to overcome their uh, negativity that were there. But Sri Lanka is still caught in the no, almost old system of the, uh, what should I say, the old age system of you know going through the ARs and FRs, etc. without taking a new step that is forward. Uh, when there are bottlenecks in our uh, administrative system, red tape in terms of investments, your government uh, tried to um, investigate the previous government's financial conduct through the FCID, setting up the, of the FCID too. 
So does that not mean that uh, even your government tried to continue on the path that was taken by s previous policy makers in terms of investigative uh, bringing uh, authorities before commissions to question them uh, about what was done instead of making the necessary changes that were required for the country? I see your penchant in trying to say what the last government did. Certainly I not. saw in your own Derana last week, Prime Minister's investigating on the last um, uh, government's lending policy that was there. So this has been become a political hobby. You know, it just keeps not changing the system, but only, you know, the same wine in different bottles. That is what goes on. So I'm sorry I'm being frank. I think I, I, appreciate I, your I, I, appreciate, I appreciate your observations too. But again, Hyde Park at Hyde Park, we would not want to talk about uh, what you have done instead of questioning you on uh, the challenges you faced and what you had not done. Because I think the people require your answers. If I may... Again, um, about the questions uh, that you raise, we continue to talk about what the UNP government did or the coalition government did, and then we talk about what the present government uh, is looking at. We have an election around the corner. What would you do differently? I would, I would basically take it head on. I would say decisive decision making. Change the archaic laws that are there. Make people responsive. You have 1.1 billion, 1.7 billion, uh, uh, 1.7 million uh, government servants. Ensure that they are productive. We spend almost 1.1 billion of that of the government revenue of out of 2 billion into that, which means more than 55 percent. Do you get a productive response out of that? You know, we need to ensure that people are accountable for them. It's not just a bunch of politicians that take these and should be accountable. Government servants are the chief accounting officers. What happens to them? You know, at this particular moment, what we are basically doing is triangulating decision making. And that needs to come right from the top itself. If you basically, because the media is absolutely awakened. You have public litigation that takes a drop of a hat. And end of the day, who is basically comforting who takes decisions? Now, for example, we basically had customs revenue increasing from 200 to 800 billion. Now there is a question asked from me, why is it that a, 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 the number of vehicles that were came, why we reduced taxes? And that was a request by the government servants that basically the custom officers wanted to get, you know, if they find um, a reward, you know, we basically stopped the reward and ensure that the government gets a full revenue, that is the investigation. Now where, they, where how on earth can this country go forward? I'm saying with all responsiveness, uh, with all responsibility, that these are the problems that exist here. Um, earlier, you alluded to a lot of uh, issues within the, uh, the economy, also to officials of the central yeah. bank and certain. Uh, but again, if you come back, uh, you'll have to work within this uh, administrative no, I think, structure. I think you know that the problem is that we were overly democratic in this process, and this I see certain good aspects of the present president. I must receive you. If you say it is good, they will say, Bez, you are going to join the government. What nonsense. We are you there say he's good because he took uh, no, the central um, bank officials head on, questioned them, held them uh, accountable. But if I say back in the day, you did not hold them accountable for their um, inaction. How can I be um, uh, holding them accountable when the central bank didn't come under my purview? Uh, your government, I'm talking yeah, about your you government. The government, that, that's where you basically give them overly democratic process. They basically respond in the same lethargic manner. You basically, now how did the president say reduce the interest rate, give me an answer next morning, and you had 2% interest rate reduction? Is that good governance? Just because you basically have a uh, president, what he said was correct. It has been going on for a period. Now, what I'm saying is I'm only taking one aspect of certain things. Now, I'm not talking the total other. They'll say, here is the deal. We are basically looking at the United National Party taking the port to on to form a government. Be very clear on that. So on that process, I'm basically saying these are the decisive areas that we need to do. The government service must have a more joint approach. There should not be a collusionary approach. Because the government officials are worried, will they go before committee? Then they hide behind that not to take decisions. The politicians get elected, they sometimes lack professional knowledge. So you have the official teaching them what to do. The chief accounting officer is the government servant, but the mm, implementing authority is the political servant. So on that basis, you have conflict. So these are the areas I would like hard, uh, Hyde Park to give more time to come out with. You're asking this Certainly. question, sometimes 10 minutes is insufficient to answer that. But I would love to have you know, more professional people coming along and getting this country off in a correct uh, we way We certainly forward. would like your uh, input as uh, an academic, as an uh, economic and financial uh, expert rather than as a politician, maybe after this break at Hyde Park to stay with us.
Welcome back. You're joining us at Hyde Park. We're in discussion with the former minister, Ravi Karnanayaka, candidate for the United National Party from the Colombo District. Uh, what do you expect the outcome for the Colombo District to be? How would the uh, uh, composition be? Well, I think going to the intense competition that is on, it has really motivated all our uh, key members from all over. And I think we will certainly give a, a, a good fight to the Port Tour and get the uh, votes that are required. But there is also a fight between the UNP and the SP, Samagit Jana Balavege. There will be a split of that votes there too. in the media, in the very, the real hearts and the minds of the people. This is a non-existent one. But you can, if political parties come forward to into the policy differences, it's perfectly acceptable. But lack of gratitude, I think people will never forgive. That is the exact situation. We have gone overboard on trying to appease and trying to make it as one team. And the lack, the approach, the, the answer we got was you form another party and go out. And then they came out to the media and absolutely lied. And court, district courts, basically upheld the version that we basically said. What would the numbers be in your analysis? Well, I'm not a soothsayer. I would love to say, I mean, Colombo District has 19 uh, MPs that are brought in. I would basically say that we, we basically have traditionally been getting 10 to 11. And I think we will be achieving that. Uh, you uh, entered Parliament in 1994. You've been a Minister of Finance, uh, Foreign Affairs, um, the Cabinet Minister for Power and Energy. You were elected, uh, you were named Best Finance Minister for the Asia-Pacific region. You've all this under your wing, but this time ar around, what are your expectations, you individually? Well, I think the people that elect us have the confidence that we basically serve them, not serve ourselves. And that's why I sometimes, you know, it is disgusting to see the uh, acrimony or the virulent approach, attack that is on our character, because that's the only thing they try to tarnish. I, I, I just be adventurous at this moment, uh, in the very because you've been very forthright in asking questions. Uh, I mean, when I was charged in Satosa, they basically said, you look at the Satosa. Now, we modernized it. If not for, for COVID, if we didn't modernize that and you had competition coming in from the Keys, Laos, Food City, Apico, all of them, you would not be able to face the curfew that was there. But so you were accused of plundering Satosa. So where is the, now it is 25 years. What is this nonsense that is there? I mean, they basically said that. Then they were saying that we, we murdered, we bombed Shah Rukh Khan, right? Mahapola, every drop of a hat. That's the sense of anybody who wants to do something in this country gets attacked in this process. I right? would like to talk a little about the privatization matter too because uh, sure. your party has advocated for privatization over uh, securing most of these uh, state-owned enterprises. But again, Satasa, uh, if we, when you talk about Satasa at the time, if this was at least uh, moved into a private part, uh, public partnership. Today in the uh, circumstance, uh, situation of a COVID-19 challenge, do you think that Satosa would have been able to uh, reach out to the people in such a way uh, as it is uh, today? It's a private owned uh, public uh, enterprise and it is able to uh, support the people in the best interest of the people. In the very, what when we took over, it was a, a store that had basically rats running all, all over, cobwebs that were there. Bread that was sold at 350 and basically had a 22 billion deficit that was there. That was modernized and it was a public private partnership. That's the sad irony. It was a public private partnership. And they made the, and you said, no, just now another thing. Now, what is the outcome of that? The people basically said, sorry, we made a mistake and then nothing that came out of it. That is the sad irony. They love to drop a, uh, at a drop of a hat. They basically mention names, do things, and nothing comes out of that. So here is a modernization case. And privatization, it was not the case. It was a commercialization process which had public-private partnership. Now look at the Port Authority of Ham Hambantota. What was there? They basically went and put a hum port in Hambantota. They spent 220 billion. Your payments were roughly 10 billion for capital and roughly 8 billion for interest. 18 billion coming off, where is the revenue? So you have a port, doesn't have ships coming in, and you pay 18 billion of the profits that are coming out of Colombo port. So what basically, when we saw this, we saw the projections or the um, uh, prognosis, just did not see sense in having uh, 18 billion paid out with no revenues coming in. Because you have to have the production bases are India or China. And China would basically not send it via Sri Lanka because of the fact that they have a, a, a cheaper and a quicker rate uh, into uh, Europe. India would not like to see uh, certain things going off Chinese ports. 
So you are caught in between. So what we basically did was we basically commercialized it. We leased it to the people who charged us that amount. We got the full 220 billion and we had ownership and we leased it to certain people. Those people have to bring the business in to pay their own loan. So what the taxpayers of Sri Lanka are going to do, we have pumped it off onto them. And today economic activity have to take, if they don't bring, we have fully recovered the money we spent on the port, we own the port, and basically they have to bring the ships into the country if they want to pay their loans off. So that is, there's no privatization there. It was only a lease that was there. So our concept is not privatization, it is commercialization. And that is what goes on. Uh, again, back to the elections, um, we see that there could be uh, only a very few possibilities. Either um, Rana Vikramasinghe will have to work with um, President Gotabe Rajapaksa, or Sajid Premadasa will have to work with him, or on the other side, um, former President Mahinda Rajapaksa. Um, how confident are you that it is Ranil Vikramasinghe who can work with uh, President Gotabe Rajapaksa in the case of an election to power against Sajid Premadasa? Well, that's a non-starter. Let's not waste time on that. If we take, it's either Mahindra Rajapaksa or Ranil Vikramasinghe, the two factions that are there. On that basis, you have executive presidency that is Gotabe Rajapaksa. So in a democratic system, the next four and a half years, uh, four, four years and three months remain to be here at the head. So any government that comes in has to work with that president. That is the foregone conclusion. Now why we believe is that we are the best is in the last eight months of running the government, what have they displayed as opposed to what we basically handed over? Economy. Economy basically was, we got a, a rundown economy. We basically beefed it up, bolstered, did our best. There were shortcomings for sure, but at least there were economic revival that was there compared to the downturn in the entire world at that moment. Then the cost of living, there is significant increase. You look at the eight months, milk has gone up, sugar has gone up, dal has gone up, petrol can reduce, they are not increasing, they are not reducing, gas should be 975, 1500. So cost of living is a major problem with revenues dwindling, your salary is insufficient to meet the monthly thing. With COVID, make it even wor worse. You basically have cost of living not coming but going up. We had the answer. We did it. Nobody can say we didn't. We are not talking. We have been performing. And that's the difference between performers and talkers. So on that score, your economy, we basically are the best party to have a revival because that has been ingrained that any time the UMP is there, you have economic activities, you have money in the pockets, you have things moving forward because we are proactive. The areas of, uh, areas of uh, security, certainly this particular government came on that agenda. But we still see certain, you know, uh, killings that are taking place, or at least deaths taking place in many areas. So I guess on that revival, we basically feel the best area that United National Party can form the government, and that's the way forward. Uh, in the case the United National Party forms a government, uh, do you think your wings won't be clipped? Well, that we have to learn from our mistakes and trying try to be more democratic in that process, we gain nothing. So I guess there has to be a more collective approach. When I say clip your wings is what? Do you get back to the officials running? And we know it is a, a mix between two. It has to somebody is to be held accountable and change the laws. First six months should be change all the laws in this country in modernizing it, keep in, in tune with what is expected. Look at the success stories of Singapore, the Malaysias, Indonesias. You know, countries are going far uh, ahead. You look at Japan, when, you, when we had uh, um, independence, they had a per capita of 49, we had 48. Today they have $55,000, we have $4,000. There has to be some problem in the very, that is the lack of will to go forward. So I guess modernization of that, then digitalization of the economy, then modernizing of the agriculture, because this is definitely a thing that has got to be done. You know, you have to have high yielding uh, varieties of um, uh, agriculture, paddy, or whether it's rubber or coconut or tea, whatever it is. You look at the paddy, Sri Lanka, you get about maybe 40 bushels per acre or a hectare, while in Philippines and Vietnam, you get 120. So the same space, labor is the same. What on earth is the three times more productivity in those type of areas? That is where we are lacking in that for... Uh, what, what corrective uh, measures and policies do you uh, propose, especially in agriculture, modernizing of the economy and, and also the SME sector? We cannot uh, ignore that either. Yes. They are in trouble. Yes, I mean, I mean, 63% of the economy is on the small and medium sector. 
and that is the sector that is most affected even though they produce most of the results that are there. Where is the interest rate reduction? Where is the ability of, you know, basically venture capital that is there? Where is the guidance that you give? Where are the incubator system that you give? None of them may take place. You know, sometimes it's so um, uh, disheartening that you come, you have meetings, you have review meetings, and it's still in the same place. So who is held accountable? If you basically take too hard a stand, they basically say fundamental right is affected of that staff member goes to uh, courts. So there has to be some equation where the judiciary, the executive, and the uh, legislator all get together and form a system that is able to come out of this system. I'm saying with experience. Because as I said, discretionary power is in question. You do nothing, no problem. You work hard, you have problem. So why work hard? you might as well have no problem with our working. That is the motto that these guys work. Let's make Sri Lanka great again. But making Sri Lanka great again has to have certain gives and takes. There's no, not only really takes. Now in this country, you have from womb to the tomb, you have subsidies being given or goodies being given. How on earth can you survive on this place? Now that, now today, you know, I have a government that said there'll be free fertilizer. Today you can't even buy fertilizer. Forget the free fertilizer. So that, that is, now that was maybe a political gimmick, may have been whatever it is, but practical sense is that it just doesn't work. Somebody has to pay for it. There is no free lunch. That's the sad irony. So I would basically say the only way forward is, now look at the MCC, not the scandalous situation. Now when we said it was good for the country, brought certain things in, we meant it. But what was it? It was shown that it was so scandalized that if you have this, you'll have to get visa to go beyond a certain point from the north to the south. You basically have the infringement of you know fundamental rights. Everybody will know what is going on. You basically will have a system where there will be a, a colony of America. Today, what has happened? They have given the report by saying, you know, what are non-existent? They said that we had $10 million, not a single cent came in. Now, so this type of preposterous lies Head during election time lead to nowhere, but only you know you can get 480 billion or 480 million dollars. Now that has no strings attached. The only thing is good governance. Now that I don't think anybody will oppose that. So here is the situation: UMP was uh, castigated as if we were selling the country, we were uh, having you know internal intrusions that were there. Today that same people have accepted that without a problem. Now if the government says that the MCC is bad it as promised before the election. Don't come back and say, here it is good and etc. We say it was, it was the best thing that was there for the country came forward. But they said, no, sorry. They defeated us on those bases. The everybody had the chauvinistic or nationalistic spirit of saying this is wrong. Now, if that is the case, please carry out your promise to the people. You said you will tear it before the election, as soon as the election is over. Now that you have election before, please do it and perform that, that is exactly what you mean. No, there will be stealthily lying. I think on that note, it's time we wrap up. Uh, one more question though. Um, are you slated to become the next leader of the United National Party? I don't think I would be presumptuous on that. It is a party decision that is there. It is certainly, I mean, the leader is there. The next most senior member in the party that exists in the party is Mr. John Amrutunga, and next is us. So it, it has a time uh, evolving process, and it's a party. As I believe, we must have a, a team winning exercise rather than an individual century hitting exercise. So that is what we basically believe in doing so. And I guess the party, when they see that there is this amount of energy and enthusiasm put in, party has revival being given. This is why certain people try to character assassinate us, because that was the short approach that is there. Now you have certain leaders that they think they're leaders, but when they are being carried, they basically want to basically get down and run, but when you put down, they can't even crawl. That is the real situation that is there. You see certain people think that they're leaders, but the economic policies that dispel out, the medical uh, opinions that they give, the general upliftment of the economic activities that are there, the human approach that is there. I, I guess all those are warped characters. So on that basis, there has to be true. Leaders are not made, they are born. And you've got to only correct them, you know, like gems that you've got to cut them and put them into place. It's not something that basically falls onto your left. You have got to struggle to get to that point. So I guess 
everybody, I mean, our party has a resolve talent. Everybody basically puts their best foot forward and ensure that there is a seniority, there's a sense of accomplishment, as well as there is a, a destiny. So all put together, make you one of All the best with your campaign for the upcoming election, thank and thank you, you for joining us at Hyde Park. I look forward to the support from Delana for the election. Thank you. Well, we had with us uh, Assistant Leader of the United National Party, former Finance Minister, former Foreign Minister, uh, Ravi Karunanayaka joining us tonight. Thank you for watching.